last week, we started this series, The Christmas Tree, looking at the women listed in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew 1. There are only five women listed there amongst the many men that are listed. If you were here last week, you would have heard Pastor Simon read out all those names, which was quite amazing just hearing them all. And it can seem a strange choice, the women that they have put in. They aren't prominent Israelite women where you would say, oh, well, yes, that makes sense if you're going to put some women in. They're the ones that you would definitely choose. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, it mentions Rahab, who we're going to look at today. And she isn't even an Israelite. She's from a foreign land, which makes it even more surprising that she's the one that has been put in. If you just quickly look at her, she doesn't appear to be a fine, upstanding person. You would think, well, okay, she's a good role model to put in there. People, yes, we'll put her name in and people will be like, oh, yes, of course. She's someone that would be good to model yourself on. If you were doing your family tree, Rahab is probably someone you'd skip over pretty quickly. There's that TV show that's on at times where they research a person's ancestry and they go back and they sometimes find out scandalous information about some long ago relative that the person didn't know of at all and afterwards probably still wishes they didn't know about them. And as we look at Rahab though, we look at who she is and what she did, we will see though that she is an amazing person. And her name appearing in the genealogy is well deserved. She doesn't just get a mention there in Matthew 1. She's also cited in the Heroes of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, where it says in verse 31, By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She is one of only two women mentioned by name in that chapter the other one being Sarah, Abraham's wife. In the book of James, he singles out Rahab as a person whose faith was shown through what she did. In James chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, it says, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So let's turn to Joshua 2 and have a look at this unlikely hero. Joshua is now in charge of the Israelites after the death of Moses. God has told him to prepare to cross over the Jordan River and to take the land that God had promised to them. To take this land, they were going to have to fight. They were going to have to defeat the people. They were going to have to capture the cities that were already established in this land. The first city they would come to is Jericho. It was a prominent, important, well-protected city which sat on a hillside guarding the central regions of the land. If they had any hope of passing into the central highlands, they needed to destroy Jericho. It was a city full of idolatry, including child sacrifice and many other sinful practices. The Israelites need to fig- to, needed to figure out what they were faced with as they came into this place. Joshua secretly sends two spies to have a look. He tells them to view the land and especially Jericho. It says in the second part of verse 1 in Joshua 2, And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Rahab was not one of God's chosen people. She was a Gentile raised in a pagan religion. She hadn't been taught about God. She hadn't personally experienced him. She hasn't been involved in any of the miraculous works and provisions God had shown his people during their time in the wilderness. She was a prostitute who lived in Jericho. Occasionally she's been referred to as an innkeeper. It's likely this was an attempt to sanitise her profession. But it also seems that there was accommodation there because it talks about in that verse about the spies lodging there. So obviously there's some form of accommodation where she was. It would be a wise move for the spies to go to her house. Men coming and going there would not be out of place. It would be a good place to find out about the city too. Jericho had very thick double walls and Rahab's house was in these walls. 
So it was a place where comings and goings could be seen. Rahab would hear what was happening from where she lived and would be able to give the spies useful information if she was willing to. Or at least by being there, they could see, they could get an idea, they could have an awareness of what was going on in the city, of what was happening there. And they'd be able to assess the strength of the city walls and the city itself. Yet going there was not by chance or even by careful planning. As we will see further in the story, God was directing these men to go to that place and to that person. It was the place and the person he wanted them to see. Why and how Rahab had become a prostitute is not clear. It could, it could have been a desperate measure to provide for herself if she'd been left destitute through death or debts. It could have been forced on her by those in power as prostitutes fe featured in quite a bit of the Canaanite religious practices. She lived in a society where women were often mistreated, devalued and taken for granted. Despite the secrecy of the spies, that they were in the city came to the attention of the king of Jericho. As the Israelites were camped just over the Jordan River, it's highly likely there were lookouts checking what they were doing. And two obvious foreigners entering Jericho would have been seen and spoken on. The men's appearance and clothing would have marked them out as different. And it was known that they had come to Rahab's house. So in Joshua verse, sorry, Joshua chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. I would have thought Rahab would have been scared by this command. You think she'd be like, oh, oh no, oh no, they know they're here, oh no, is that what they're here for? And being absolutely terrified by what could happen. Jericho was a large and powerful city, so it makes sense that the king of Jericho was not someone you wanted to get on the wrong side of. She owes no allegiance to these men that have come. They're complete strangers from people who are actually looking to conquer her city. It would seem obvious that her immediate response would have been to give them up and to make sure that she disassociated herself from them. She might have even hoped to get some form of a reward for doing this. At least she'd get on the good side of the king and maybe even get some sort of really good reward for it. She could have already sent the men away as soon as they came and then could honestly tell the king that they weren't there, that she had had nothing to do with them. Instead, she helped and protected the spies. Joshua chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. What she tells the king's men sounds reasonable enough, quite believable. She acknowledges the men had come, because that was already known. But she said she had no idea where they were from or why they were there. Then she says they're no longer around, that when the city was about to be locked up for the night, the gates closed and locked up, the men left, that they were only there for that time and then they'd left. And she encourages the king's men to go after them, which they do. They pursue the men, well, they think they're pursuing the men, as far as the Jordan River. They search as far as the Jordan River for these men. As we look further, we see that that isn't the case. Rahab's taken the men and hidden them on the roof of her house. The, the roof was flat, and on it were stalks of flax that were there drying in the sun. Flax was a plant that was cultivated for its fibres, and it grew to over a metre in height. The plant needed to dry before the fibres could be removed from it, and the roof was a good spot to put it, to have it there, to let it dry out, and also provide a good covering for quickly hiding the men. Her actions seem strange. Rahab's put herself in incredible danger. If it was found out that she had lied to the king's men, and not only that, that she'd actually hidden these men on the roof of her house, I doubt she would be dealt with very leniently. Most likely she'd be killed. 
It seems incredible that this foreign, powerless woman goes out of her way by doing what she certainly didn't need to, putting herself in huge danger to help the Israelites who were there to spy out her city in anticipation of destroying it. She goes to the men and tells them why she is doing this in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. It says, And said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She makes some incredible statements here. Her first one, I know that the Lord has given you the land. How amazing that someone who is not a follower of God could say such a thing. She's living in this heavily fortified city where she would expect to be protected. The Israelites haven't even crossed over the Jordan River yet and they haven't tried to conquer any of the land. It wasn't as if Jericho was the last battle and everyone had seen what they'd done to the other cities. Jericho was the first one they were going to attack. Certainly if they destroyed Jericho, if they managed to conquer it, then it would open up the rest of the land to them. But Jericho would have expected to be able to withstand their attack. Her statement doesn't refer to their powerfulness as fighters. It refers to the might of God. It is God who had done mighty things, a God she doesn't know, yet she has seen and heard what he has done. Despite the gods of her land, she has recognised the one true God and knows that what he has said will happen. I wonder how many of the Israelites sitting in their camp across the river, looking at the powerfulness of Jericho and the other cities in that land, would make this same statement of faith. Certainly 40 years before, when they were told by God then to take the land, not many of them had any such faith. They actually refused to do it. It's interesting sometimes how what God is doing is obvious to people that you wouldn't expect to actually see it. Rahab recognises the greatness of God. She has seen what God has done through his people. And instead of ignoring this, instead of thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me, or thinking that our gods, our people are stronger, she responds to God. Despite what she has been taught, seen and practised in her religion, She makes this incredible statement of faith in verse 11 up there where she says, For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She's not saying, I think your soldiers are more powerful, they'll be able to fight better than our soldiers. She's not saying, I think your God is stronger than our gods. She's declaring that God is the true God. He's not the God of a particular place or a particular attribute like many of the pagan gods were thought to be. Rahab, despite who she is and where she lives, could see the truth of God so clearly. And not only seeing this, she acts in response to it. Her belief in who God is causes her to go out of her way at risk to herself to help God's people. She had no guarantee of reward, although she does ask the men to spare her life when they conquer the city. She asks this also for her family. She's not just looking out for herself. She's looking out for more than just herself. She's looking out for her family as well. And this asking that was another step of faith on her part. She doesn't ask to somehow be able to leave the city before they attack or anything like that, or she doesn't make plans to do that sort of thing. She asks them that when you come in, will you save me? And she, yeah, these men, they could have been forgetful or untrustworthy, but she is willing to put her life in their hands because she sees the greatness of God and she trusts God by trusting his people. She 
She lets the men down from her house by a rope through the window, another risky action. They could have been seen escaping and she would have had no excuse. It just seems incredible that they weren't seen, really. It's a city wall. You think someone would have spotted, like a person climbing down a rope from the outside. But no, they weren't. But there was a big risk she was taking in this. And she protects the men even further by telling them in verse 16, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go on your way. Before the men go, they tell her that when the Israelites come into the land, she's to tie a scarlet cord in the window that they've gone out of and to get all her family together there. From the text in verse 21, it seems that Rahab tied the cord in her window straight away. So certain was she of deliverance, even though it was going to be a while before the Israelites actually came to the city. It's often held that the scarlet colour specified for the cord was significant linking it back to the blood that the Israelites were commanded to sprinkle on the doorposts when God rescued them from Egypt. If they obeyed this command, if they put the blood on their doorposts, they would be spared the destruction that God brought upon the Egyptians. If Rahab obeyed this command to put out this cord, she too would be spared the destruction God was bringing on Jericho. The men do what Rahab has said and hide in the hills for three days. Then they come back to Joshua and tell him what has happened. They quote Rahab when they tell him in verse 24, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know what happens next with Jericho. When it's time to take this incredibly strong and well-protected city, God tells the Israelites to march around the city for six days. On the seventh day, they march around seven times, they blow the trumpets and they shout. The walls fall down and the Israelites go in and capture the city. Even though Rahab's house was in the city walls, so you think that definitely she'd be killed, in Joshua 6.25 it says that Rahab and her family were saved alive and that she has lived in Israel to this day. God protected them from the the destruction that was around them, and Rahab then became part of the Israelite community. I like a comment I saw somewhere which says, Rahab became a living symbol of the transforming effect of saving faith. What can we learn from Rahab's story? One thing is that faith can be found in the most unlikely of people. Rahab probably wouldn't have been anyone's pick to be the one who provides the spies with protection and information. And to then become so transformed that she is an important person in Israelite history, be recorded in the genealogy of Christ and referred to elsewhere in the New Testament. You would expect her to have handed the spies straight in to the authorities. Yet she was God's choice because he saw the faith that she possessed. He saw her heart and not her outward appearance. We see that faith transcends circumstances, backgrounds, situations. It can be found in the most unlikely people or even the most likely people. It's not limited by how a person is, how they look, what they do, who they are. God knew she was the right person for this, just as we see throughout the Bible that God's choices are not always man's choices. Think of David when the prophet came to anoint the next king and his family didn't even bother bringing David in from the fields because they were sure that he wouldn't be the one. All the people in Jericho saw and heard the things Rahab had seen and heard. The things that Rahab had seen and heard about God and his people, it wasn't some special secret inside knowledge that she had. All the people in that city had heard and seen this. The amazing things God had done and the victories he'd already given his people were known by everyone in Jericho. It wasn't a secret. Rahab said fear had come upon them, that their hearts had melted. Yet she is the one who, despite this, comes out with that statement of faith about who God is. She showed godly fear, just as Proverbs 1 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We see here that God is able to link us up with the right people. On a certain level, it made sense for the men to go to Rahab's house. But they had to trust that this was where God was sending them, that this was the person that God was sending them to and that they wouldn't be caught if they went there. 
They could have disregarded Rahab, thinking she was of no account, that she couldn't be the one that God had for them to, to go to, to speak to, that God would have someone much more likely, someone much more suitable for them. As they trusted God, they found the exact person he had for them. If they had not taken notice of Rahab, if they had not trusted what she had said, if they thought, oh, maybe she's just leading us into a trap, we're going to be trapped up here on a roof and we're going to be killed, if they thought that, the outcome could have been very different, just as it was with the spies who were sent out 40 years earlier and who had refused to believe God. We need to trust God and to see the people that he has for us. When he calls you to do something, he's already prepared those people that will help you in this. We see that God's victory didn't depend on external strength and might. It depended on people being obedient to God's word. The spies, the people of Israel, and Rahab and her family needed to obey God to see the victory, to see the deliverance that he had for them. This is true for us. It doesn't matter who we are, what our background is. It doesn't matter what our skills and abilities are. What it matters is that we recognise who God is, that we listen to him in faith and that we act in obedience to what he says. I liked in Pastor James' sermon a few weeks ago when he was sharing about the path guide. He talked about how in Hebrew there are not separate words for listen and for obey. It's the same word. The idea is that if you are really listening to God, you will obey him. The two are intricately bound together. We see this with Rahab. She listened to God, even though she had no reason to. At that stage, she wasn't one of his people. And in listening, she obeyed him and her life was completely changed. Let's make sure that that's what each of us is doing, that we're listening to God with a response of obedience so that we can see the amazing things that God does have for us. Rahab saw some amazing victories, some amazing things that God did because she responded to God in faith. She listened to him and responded in faith. We're going to take communion now. We've just looked at an incredible story of God's saving grace as he rescued Rahab, a woman many would have scorned, cast aside, held to be of no account. And God brought her in to become part of his people. And God has done that for us too. He has rescued us from sin and death. None of us deserved it. None of us was good enough. We can't say, oh, well, we're not like Rahab, therefore we deserve it. No, none of us deserved it. But God has done it out of his love for us. He's brought us into his family. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has done this amazing thing for us, but it was done because of Jesus dying on the cross, because he was willing to sacrifice. It's, a, it's an incredible privilege that the God of the heavens above and the earth beneath loves us so much, that Jesus was willing to die so that we could have that reconciliation with God, so that we could come and be in God's presence. As it says in that Ephesians verse, he you know, raised us up with Jesus and seated us with him in the heavenly places. What an amazing privilege, what an amazing love of God. And we respond to God in faith and love and obedience. And just as Jesus said, we take the bread, we take the cup and we give him thanks. So let's eat together remembering that this came, the privilege that we have, what we have came about because of his sacrifice, because of his body that was broken. And let's drink together knowing his blood was shed for our sake. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the story of Rahab, for her faith and her obedience, Lord. Even though she had no direct knowledge of you, no direct relationship with you, yet she recognised who you are. And Lord, you saved her. You brought her into your people, Lord God. She became a child of yours, Lord. And Lord, thank you that you have done the same for us. You have brought us into your family, Lord God. We have become your sons and daughters because of Jesus' sacrifice. We thank you for 
him, the obedience that he showed, Lord, to you, the Father, that he was willing to die so that we could live, Lord God. We thank you that even when we were dead in our sins, you made us alive in Christ. Lord, I pray that we will live in that response of obedience, that we will listen, Lord, and obey, that we will respond in faith, Lord God, to all that you say to us. We give you thanks, Lord, your amazing, mighty God, the God of the heavens above and the earth beneath. Amen.